Hello. Hello. Hi, Kimmy. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Alan Eskins, author. Uh, I am here with the privilege of talking to Kimmy Cunningham Grant, whose book, The Silent Woods, uh, is the Barnes & Noble mystery thriller pick of the month. Um, and I want to welcome everybody to this conversation. I'm looking forward to it. And I want to start, Kimmy, with uh, my book, um, The Stolen Hours, was the pick last month. And I want to ask you, how did you feel when your book came out as the mystery pick of the month? Oh, that's a good question. Before we say that, um, before I answer, I just want to say, Alan, it's such a privilege to get to talk to you. Um, I've admired your work for a long time. And um, so I'm really thankful to be here. And as far as the Barnes and Noble pick, I honestly, I got that email and I, I cried because I was just so excited. It was so unexpected to get like that great of news about a paperback. And so I was just so thrilled and, and I'm so grateful to Barnes and Noble for that honor. Now, are, are you on Instagram by chance? I am. Okay. Did you get all the pictures from all the Barnes and Noble across the country? Yes, posting? that was incredible. It was just, it was amazing to get all the Barnes and Noble across the country sending photos and of their of the book. So it was really cool. Yeah, for for those out there who aren't writers, one of the you know big thrills is to see your book in a bookstore to begin with, but to have your own table or your own end cap is just so cool. So congratulations, by the way. Uh, Terrific book. Absolutely loved it. Um, I, I, you are such a talented writer. Um, and I want to begin with where did the idea for the Silent Woods come from? Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of messy as far as process and as far as ideas. Um, luckily, even, you know, I'll tell my agent about a plan. And, and to her credit, she's never actually said the words. It doesn't sound like you have a plot yet, Kimi. So, you know, I'll, I'll come up with an image or just something really vague and I kind of build from there. But as far as this book, I had written a short story. And in it, there was a father who had an infant daughter. And um, in that situation, in the short story, the father felt that his little girl was in danger. And so he took her um, into the woods and, and tried to, um, he disappeared, but he dropped her off at a friend's house to take care of her. Um, now this short story, I sent it to so many literary magazines and it got rejected, you know, maybe 50 times or something ridiculous. Um, but I got uh, a, a lot of good feedback on it. So even though it was rejected, people, kind of wrote a little comment in the margin or something and said, send us something again, or, you know, this was closed or something. So I, I didn't give up on it, but I tabled it for a while. Um, and then um, I, I also at the same sort of after I let that story go, I got this image um, and it was a very distinct image. And I won't say what that image is because it would be a little bit of a spoiler for the book, but um, the idea was that a man saw something and knew that he ought to report it or do something about it. But if he did, it would really jeopardize his own happiness and life and well-being. And so when I figured out that I could tweak maybe some of the details of the situation from, from the guy in my short story and maybe expand on it and um, incorporate that, I, that image that I had, um, once I figured out they could be one and the same, I kind of went with it from there. I wonder, so you have an exceptional gift for prose. Um, and I was wondering, for some writers that comes easy, for some that they struggle with it and work on it, how, what's your situation? Does those elegant prose uh, writing, does that come easy for you? Well, I appreciate that. Um, honestly, I, um, I was a poet. I published poems before I ever published prose. And so um, I do I do feel like studying poetry and writing poetry. Um, I still try to read poetry a good bit. Um, I feel like it asks me, it reminds me to pay attention to each word and to think about um, the fact that every word really does matter, that there's an economy to be aware of. And, and so um, I, th I think that probably plays a part. I, I sometimes think you can almost tell when you're reading a novel, if the novelist has a background in poetry because of the the, the well-written um, prose. But uh, so my next question is, uh, I, I really love 
the twist at the end. I won't say what it is, but I really love the twist. I did not see it coming. And I was curious, did you have that twist in mind when you started the novel or are you someone who you kind of create the plot as you go along? It's a little bit of both. Um, I, I generally don't know the ending when I start writing a book. Um, but eventually I start to wander too much and I have to kind of map out an outline or, or come up with a plan. Um, my agent has said, you know, I feel like, you know, it's not moving forward. <laughs> you know, we need to get things uh, moving. It's well written, but nothing's happening for 40 pages. So then we have to circle back. Um, so yeah, I don't generally know the ending. I didn't know the twist. I knew that I knew certain things I wanted to have work out certain ways, but I didn't necessarily know um, the exact ending. It sounds like you have a very uh, brilliant agent. You know, yes. And I'll just say to all the folks that are listening that um, Alan and I have the same agent, um, Amy Clogley. So she, I'm not sure if she's here today, but um, it's very cool that to, to get to um, give her a little praise because yes. she has back-to-back -back, uh, Barnes & Noble picks of the month here um, with Alan and me. And, um, Alan, I'm not sure about you, but I know for me, my submission was just like a slush pile submission that I sent her a query, you know, years ago, and she believed in me. And so that's just, it's just like really cool to, to get to go on this journey with her. Yeah, no, it was very similar to me. Um, I was extremely happy to have her as my agent. Uh, so my next question is, when did you know that you wanted to be a writer? Mm -hmm. Um. I was an early reader and I was writing stories in notebooks when I was like seven or eight. So I, I think I knew or that I wanted to write when I was really young and I sort of, you know, considered other things and dabbled in other things in the time since, but I, I think I knew early that I loved books and I loved, and I loved stories and I wanted to try to be a writer. And for me, there was a, a, a line where I, wrote just for my own pleasure, my own fun for a long time before one day I said, you know what, I am going to try and get published. Mm -hmm. And where, how did that come about for you? Or did you have that same kind? Or did you always think I'm going to be published from a very young age? I, I don't think I had that confidence that I, that I would get published. I think I had that hope that I would. Um, but I don't think I knew how hard it would be, um, you know, back when I was younger. I think I, I, I think I hoped um, that I would be able to, to publish books someday. Okay, so I'm going to open up now to questions that were sent in. Um, let me start with, okay, I already asked that one. Oh, um, what's the best advice you ever received as a writer? Um, I think, I think probably the best advice is, um, probably to just, to always be open to that feedback, to try to revise and, and keep on working that, you know, your, your first draft, I would say my first draft of anything is never good. You know, like it's, it's never it's always requires tons and tons of revision before it, it feels good. Um, so those first drafts are, you know, a first draft is just a draft. And usually for me, like a fourth or fifth draft is also still just a draft. Um, I, I revise pretty obsessively. That's like where I spend most of my time revising, um, not drafting. I can draft quickly, but I go back and circle and circle and, and revise. And how long does it take you to do a novel? Um, I haven't actually ever kept track. I'm not super fast. I would say, um, you know, a year for a draft, probably in a year of revision, maybe something like that. And then there's actually quite a few people that ask different forms of this question, but what is your writing process in terms of, you know, researching the novel, you know, starting out? How do you, what's your process from beginning to end? Um, well, I do try, I do kind of research as I go. Um, so I, I like to 
give myself the freedom to say, um, where could this end and where, could, where might it take me? And sometimes, you know, a lot of times it's in that research that I find, you know, really interesting kind of paths to pursue. Um, one that comes to mind is that when I was revising these silent works with my editor and we were getting pretty close to being done, um, there was like one line and it was something about Finch um, saying, I think this, she's a princess and um my editor sarah wrote back and said you know i'm not sure that finch would be interested in princesses like maybe it was something else and so I'm like okay what else could it be and so i start reading you know mythology and looking into all these different possibilities of what a girl who lives in the woods might be fixated with and um so i, I researched that and, and sort of found the idea of that um the history of the wood nymph and that kind of thing. So I like that research. I like how it can take me down a different, a different path. Um, having said that, I do pick up some books to read usually while I'm writing, um, not necessarily in the genre, but like a nonfiction book that would help me to learn more about my subject. Um, I also do sometimes a Google search. I feel like, Alan, I don't know if this is true for you, but my, um, I feel like my Google search if someone would look through my history, it would be kind of um, damning, you know, like, why is this person Googling? Could this type of gun be used to do this, you know? Um, so yeah, sometimes I do that kind of research too. And in this novel, there was um, uh, the aspect of the soldier in Afghanistan. Um, how did you research that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I had to learn, I had to read and learn a little bit about um, panic attacks, how people can learn to manage um, that when they don't have resources nearby necessarily. And um, it was, my dad is a veteran. And so it was really, really important to me that I um, handle that veteran experience with um, reverence and, and grace. And so before the book was published, I, um, I sent the pages that involved anything with um, the war experience to a friend who, who was a, a veteran in that war and had him read it. And he did help me tweak the language a little bit, places where I hadn't quite um, nailed it. He helped me make sure that it felt more accurate, I guess. Yeah, I found that no matter how in depth I go in my research, if I give it to somebody who's lived that experience, mm -hmm. I've always missed something or a few things um because it's, it's hard to get in those shoes you know having never been there so uh another question is how do you structure your writing time plays goals that kind of thing yeah um i generally am a morning writer um i it's really the only time that my brain feels um open and clear uh, by midday, I'm usually feeling like oh, I have too many other ideas in my head. So I generally make myself get up and write in the morning. Um, so I get a couple hours in um, before anyone else in my house is awake. Um, sometimes I can squeeze in some revision at other places in the week um, if, if it's not uh, writing like from scratch, if I have that kind of thing, um, looking back at a scene. So generally I'm a, I'm a morning writer. As far as goals, um, a lot of times I do lean on uh, my agent, Amy, and I'll say, can you give me a deadline for this? Because I would just, you know, write little pretty sentences and not stay focused probably for a long time. But luckily then she'll say, well, what about end of June? Can we, can we shoot for that? And she'll help me out with that. Do you send your work into your agent, um, before you think you have a, a first draft done? Um, it depends. I, um, I, I don't, I don't remember if I did with these silent woods or if I sent her um, a, like a draft, a full draft. Um, I, with my new work that I'm working on right now with the new project, um, she read it. Um, I think I sent her the first 10 pages and just said, does this seem like I'm on track? And then I sent her more pages after that, but it's still not done and she has read it. Um, since you mentioned that, there is uh, one person who asked, uh, when's the next book coming out? And uh, 
Um, I really enjoy your writing style. Thank you for that. Um, for the and what, comment. if anything, can you tell us about the next book? What, add that to it. Okay. Um, the next book's not done. Um, I'm not. I'm not really sure exactly when it will come out. I. I. If I had to guess, maybe 2024. Um, but I, but nothing is set in stone, so I'm not sure yet about that. Um, but I'm excited about this new project because, like my previous two novels, it takes place kind of in a remote location. In this case, it's set um, in Idaho and. Um, a young woman who suspects an old friend might be missing goes deep into the wilderness um, with an ex-boyfriend um, to see if she can find her. So I'm excited about it. I think it'll be um, my last two books have kind of had male protagonists and I'm excited to have a strong woman at the center of this one. Uh, did you find it at all unnerving writing male protagonists? Um, or did they come natural to you? Well, I feel actually a little more, I feel like it's a little harder for me to write the, the female protagonist. Um, I think just because I have this like weird paranoia that people are going to think that it's me like sorting out my own issues, <laughs> um, which is not the case, but um, yeah, I feel a little more nervous. That I think, I think actually in my fiction, I don't know if this is true for you, but I am always sort of you know, sifting through something of my own subconsciously as I, as I write, like, um, you know, I was writing um, these silent woods when I was, you know, I had a, an eight-year-old at the, when I was writing it and, um, you know, just thinking about how he viewed the world and how he experienced nature and um, the things that he would see and be curious about. So all of that was kind of in my mind as I was creating the character of Finch. Um, so yeah, I, I, we'll see how this new character pans out. So uh, The Stolen Hours was my seventh novel and it's the first time that I wrote a female point of view and I was extremely nervous about doing that. Um, yeah. I, 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 I sweated it quite a bit before I wrote it. Um, but unless I missed it, I, I don't recall um, in the silent woods if you actually said what state it was in um but just out of curiosity um the setting how did you pick that setting and um is that a setting you're familiar with um right i intentionally don't say it because of course cooper would never accidentally slip and say where he was um but in my mind i kind of picture it in northern um pennsylvania northern appalachia kind of um just in the um uh, you know, there are mountains um, and there are big unpopulated spaces in certain parts of Pennsylvania. Um, so that's kind of what I was picturing it. Yeah, I had it in Appalachia, but I was thinking a little further south. But mm -hmm. um, so now that you're writing about Idaho, how do you decide Idaho and, and what do you do to research that? Um, I, we've spent a good bit of time in Idaho. Um, it's one of my favorite places to visit. Um, we're an outdoorsy family. We like to um, hike a lot and mountain bike and kayak and fish and um so we're we're really outdoorsy and so um i spent actually the the year of um 2021 um and first part of 2022 my husband's a professor and we were on he was on a sabbatical and so we took a camper and lived in it for much of his sabbatical year. Um, and so part, a big part of that time we did spend in Idaho, um, in, in like national forests and wilderness areas. So, um, you know, I do feel like I have lots of pictures for the times when I feel like I don't, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble describing things, but um, we, we spent a good bit of time there too. So Rachel B asks, who is your favorite character that you've created in your book and why? Mm -hmm. um, that's a tough question. I like all of the, not all. I don't like, um, I don't like Judge and Mrs. Judge in this book, but I do like the rest of the characters. Um, and I hope that they're, um, they're all in their own way, compelling and, um, you know, that they, they all feel real. They, they felt real to me. Do any of the characters in any of your books, not just this one, have a more special place in your heart than others? Hmm. Um, you know, in my book, Fallen Mountains, I always liked the character Possum. 
and in this book i i do really i do really like cooper and i do really like finch you know i love them as a unit too the two of them together not just um individually but who they are as a family and on that note fresh l asks how do you develop the relationships between each character jake cooper and finch um you know i think i this kind of goes back to the revision thing for me i i'll i'll write a write a scene or write a chapter and then i kind of decide this isn't the characters aren't full enough it, do, it isn't quite um believable it doesn't feel compelling um i also um i read aloud like i read my work aloud because i want it to sound good um i think that goes back to the um poetry thing like i want there to be a certain musicality to the language um so yeah i think um just trying to make them as as real and so to me that means that they they have really good qualities really endearing qualities but that they are also flawed that you think oh don't do that which is with each of them too you know i uh, i too read my stuff a lot I, I find that when i edit on computer I, it, it feels one way to me. When I put it on paper, it feels another way to me. And when I read it out loud, it's yet a third way. And I, I see different things using the different editing sources that I do. Um, have you ever read or edited or revised it going backwards, where you read the last chapter, then the next last chapter and go that way? I haven't. I love that idea, though. Is that what you do? I have not done it yet. Um, I just heard about it from somebody within the past few months, and I thought that sounds really interesting because what it would do is, in your head, as you're reading it, there's this pull that's pulling you forward in the, in the story, and sometimes you get caught up in that current, and you, you miss things. But when you if you read yeah. it backwards, I would think that pull wouldn't be there and you'd be reading each chapter as if it's its own short story. But I, I find it interesting and I, I think I'd like to give it a try. Yeah, I love that. And also I was, I'm kind of happy to hear you say that you do a printed copy too. Um, I'm the same way, I guess, looking at it on the screen, especially when you're writing novels, the, the, um, there's just so much to scroll through and I'll say, did that was that like two chapters ago or six chapters ago and it's just really hard to kind of keep track of it once it gets so big so i always have to print out and read um with a pencil in hand at some point and and what i could read it on a computer screen think okay it looks good print it up and read it. it's like well, how did i miss all this stuff yeah there's um, a, a lot of mistakes jump out for some it, reason yeah mistakes and just you know that that paragraph isn't working at all and you know it, I don't know why just putting it on paper does that, but uh, anonymous attendee has asked if you had to give a quick overview of the book, how would you describe it? Um, I, I think of myself as writing literary suspense. Um, it has been called a thriller. I think there's a little bit of, um, you know, hopefully some of the chapters are thrilling. Hopefully there's a lean forward um, component to the book, but I also think that um, even the writer's suspense itself lies a lot on the fact that you're reading it and rooting really hard for the characters. So it, to me, my, my work always feels more uh, literary and character driven than, um, than like just, you know, plot driven. Uh, another one uh, from an anonymous attendee. Hi, Mrs. Grant. I finished the book yesterday just in time for this event. I noticed there were a lot of references to scripture, the Bible. Um, and did you add this element because you feel it benefited the story in a particular way? Or is your own faith background the influence? Mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit of both. Um, my own faith background, I hope, is always going to influence anything that I write um, because it's very important to me. So um, I think it's always going to bleed into the things that I'm that I'm working on. Um, that's my hope. Um, and I also uh, I really wanted this character of um, you know I think I'm gonna do this might be a little bit of a spoiler. So if you haven't read the book, you might want to just um, not listen for a second here. Um, you've been warned. Um, I really wanted that 
the character of Scotland to be um, one of those people that's like a religious person and you're not sure if it's like a creepy thing or like a legit, you know, like their heart is actually pure. Um, and so as I was writing this book um, and Scotland became, you know, bigger and more real to me, um, you know, I really liked this idea that he would kind of um, correct Cooper's language if he says a bad word and, you know, kind of start singing these hymns, which actually might be very beautiful, but coming from him, it's a little abrasive. And so I wanted him to be really nuanced. And I, I liked how um, I felt like his, uh, his religious background was a good way to enhance that. And I will tell you, you, uh, you hit the nail on the head. Um, that character really uh, does have a lot of ambiguity to him. As you're reading the novel, you really don't know um, where he's coming from. And I, it kind of makes it the whole foundation of the story a little unstable and unnerving and, until you understand and, at the end. But mm -hmm. uh, again, spoilers done. You can come back now. <laughs> Uh, next question. How do you decide opening line of your book? Some say they are the most important. Is that true? Um, hmm, that's a good question. I think I, I do agree that the opening, if not the opening line, the opening paragraph is really, really important for a book. Um, anytime I'm thinking about reading a book, I will open it up and see if I like the first paragraph because I'm I'm the type of reader who um, you know I like um, the writing to be strong and so if sometimes I can read the first three sentences and I'm like this is not gonna I won't like this I can tell um, even if the story sounds good and the back of the book sounds interesting to me it has to be written in a way that that I find engaging so I do think that um, the opening line is really important having said that. Um, you know, I thought I had the opening line to these silent woods, and I do remember going back and changing it a couple times. <laughs> so even though I felt like, all right, that's the tone. I, I really like where this is going to go. This is a perfect opening line. It didn't stick. So. Yeah, I have the same experience. I, the m novel I'm outlining right now, this wonderful opening line came to me. I wrote it down and I know by the time the book is published, that line will be nowhere in the book, yeah, but on. you know, sometimes like yeah that's beautiful that's great and when the time comes like yeah, it doesn't fit but um so alan do you do all of your do, are you a big outline or do you outline like kind of have a game plan from the get-go or do you i'm a huge outliner uh i i don't sit down to start writing the novel typing it up until i know the full story from beginning to end i know each plot point for each chapter i have biographies for my characters yeah. uh because I'm I'm structured that way. I need to be that structured that way. Um, my first novel took me 20 years to complete. I can't wait that long each time. So I, I know that if I outline, I can get them done in a year. But if I don't outline, it could be 20. Um, what books did you read as a child? Kathy H. asks. Um. I read a lot of books when I was uh, in the elementary school. I, um, I specifically remember reading um, Susan Cooper's books. She was an author I really liked as a kid. Um, I liked Catherine Patterson. Probably my favorite book growing up was um, Natalie Babbitt's Talk Everlasting. I just reread that with my kids last year and it's so well written and it's just such a good story. Um, yeah. That's the one, that's probably the one that really sticks out as being, oh, and The Witch of Blackbird Pond is also a favorite. Are there any books that you read as a, as a young person or as an adult that had a strong emotional impact on you? Mm -hmm. I would say, um, well, as a kid, definitely Tuck Everlasting did. For some reason, I think I was probably 11 when I read it and the protagonist is 11 and she sort of has to face this idea of like, would I want to live forever um, if I could? And so I, it really resonated with me at the time. Um, so that had a big impact. And then I would say the book that had um, the biggest emotional impact on me um, in more recent years is um, The Light Between the Oceans. I don't know if you've read that, but um, I, so, you know, I'm a mom and so I have, you know, kind of these, I have 
I'm multitasking more than I ought to be most of the time. And so I'm like on my elliptical working out while I'm reading this book, weeping, like bawling my eyes out. And my kid who was like three at the time comes into the room. He's like, mommy, what is wrong? And so I'm just like, this is, this is a book. It's so sad. And um, anyway, so I think that's like the strongest emotional response I've had to a book um, recently. Although I am reading this. It's a book of poems, Kate Bear, What Kind of Woman? And um, it is also really resonating right now. And yesterday I was at the orthodontist and like reading it and getting choked up and I had to set it aside. So when I was, I think, 13, I read Where the Red Fern Grows. Oh, and yeah. I grew up in the Ozarks and I had dogs and that book made me cry and it made me angry that it made me cry. Yeah. And so I read it again just to prove that I could read it without getting all teary eyed. Nope, couldn't do it. It didn't, didn't work. It did not work. And I'm, t I'm getting to the, the big scene where the, you know, the sadness hits and I'm thinking, okay, these are words on paper. These people aren't real. This isn't happening. Just read the words. And no, I, 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 I cried a second time. So, um, so it, funny story about that particular book, because it is really emotional. Um, my mom was working as a teacher's aide and she said, oh, I'm reading to my students this wonderful book, Where the Red Fern Grows. And I was like, oh, you know, and she's such a dog person. And I'm thinking, this is, you know, I can't, I'm so surprised that you seem so positive about it, but she hadn't finished it. So she finished uh. it and she's reading it out loud to her students, like weeping and crying. <laughs> So, and the kids are like, what is wrong with her? Because they're, you know, like 12 or something. And um, so anyway, yeah, that has a strong impact. It has a, it's got a good punch. It does. Uh, another online question is, will there ever be a sequel or spinoff of this book? I would love to, to, I would love to hear about Finch's life as an adult. Hmm. You know, for, I have, it has crossed my mind uh, to know, to, to maybe, really? to write something a spinoff but um i have not really thought about it a whole lot um and it's it's not something i think i would um probably try to do for a while like i would let it maybe breathe for 10 years or something i think um marilyn robinson wrote you know her trilogy but there were big spaces in between the books so. did you say you would let it breathe for 10 years yeah like you know i wouldn't <laughs> write about it now but maybe Maybe someday. <laughs> You're young enough to have that luxury. <laughs> well, I, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Um, so you come to writing uh, from poetry and uh, more of a literary background. What drew you to the world of suspense and mystery? Uh, you know, this is going to sound like a crazy story, but I was, um, I was writing and, and I had started publishing poems. And I also did write a book of nonfiction that was published in 2012. Um, and it really, uh, it seemed like that was, you know, I was going to kind of go one of that route to either creative nonfiction or poetry. It seemed like I had some promise in both of both um, options. Um, and then uh, I just got this idea for a novel and I wanted to write it. So um, it happened to occur when I had a, um, my first baby and he was maybe five or six weeks old. And I just, like I was in this big state of change in my life and I kind of thought I'm gonna, you know, and during nap times, I'm gonna sit down and try to, try to see if I can make this work. Um, so it took me six years to, to just kind of wing it. It was not an easy transition for me, but, um, I did eventually get it done. Uh, so is uh, another online attendee asks, is writing a full-time job or can you be a successful writer balancing a day job and writing? Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of people do, do both. And for, um, I don't know, maybe, I think many years I did both. Um, right now I am, I am just writing, but I also homeschool my two kids. So that's kind of also my day job. Yeah. If I could give my two cents, uh, I, I worked full time when I wrote my first novel and 
it took me 20 years. So uh, yeah. if you're not in a hurry, yeah. Uh, it, but now that I'm doing a book a year, uh, I retired from my law practice and I, I do this full time because it's what I love to do. So it all just kind of depends on what pressure you put on yourself t- as far as timelines. If you're in no hurry, yeah, you can do both. Uh, if you, you know, do it if you enjoy it. So, uh, Marsha B asks, "What do you do if you have writer's block?" That's a great question. Um, because I do, I do still get it. I think my um, I have two responses to it. Number one, I find that the best way to avoid writer's block is to write every day. Um, it's always harder for me when I take a break or take some time away from the a manuscript that I, I find that the writer's block hits hardest. Um, so if, as long as I keep it fresh in my mind, I tend to not get to, I don't spin my wheels as much. Um, and having said that, I think I've also sort of given myself the liberty to, to just write junk if I have to, because even if I write sentences and a chapter and or a scene that I think, you know, this really is not good. Um, I can go back and fix it or I can cut it. And oftentimes it helps me write the next scene or the next paragraph or the next chapter. And eventually it gets good. Um, so I think, yeah, just committing to saying, you know, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to write, I am going to sit down and do this. And it might be garbage today, but it will help me get to something that's good. Do you set a word count limit or I'm just gonna sit down for an hour and write or how, do you set limits on yourself for that? Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. Like I, it depends, you know, if I have a little bit of a larger chunk of time, I can usually set a word count. Um, but for me, sometimes I do find that if I think too much about word count then I get wordy, you know, like I, and I find myself, I have to go up back and cut because I, I took, you know, 87 words to say something that I can actually say pretty well in 23. So um, sometimes that word count pressure doesn't work for me. There is a, uh, a saying that I like. I don't know who said it first, but it wasn't me. Um, first draft, I'm shoveling sand into a sandbox so I can come back later and build the sand castles. Mm-hmm. And I've always, li- always liked that because it gives you kind of permission to, you know, yeah, this isn't going to be good enough in the final draft but it's good enough for the first draft it's good enough to get you to the next chapter it's good enough to keep you going on 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 the story yeah it's kind of freeing to say not every sentence every word has to be great uh today it has to be great eventually but it doesn't have to be great today right um abina d asks what was your hardest scene to write in the silent woods mm-hmm. and why yeah um You know, I think I really struggled with um, my scenes that include Marie. I think um, when I made, when I had a first draft of this book, I had a friend, um, had two friends read it. And um, I said, well, I asked kind of, what did you think of each character? And um, one of the things that, so I said, you know, what did you think of Marie? And um, she was like, I didn't mind her. Um, so, so I was like, well, that is not going to work. So I needed to go back and kind of revisit this and and figure out like, what was her purpose in the book and, um, how can I make character, a reader, how can I help a reader to, to, um, care about her and to see, um, the goodness that she brings to the table. Um, so I think I did struggle with those and trying to kind of going back and forth, figuring out what was her relationship with people going to feel like, um, so yeah, I think the um, that was probably the hardest part. And again, you um, you're kind of creating this as you go, so you haven't thought out who Marie is in advance of sitting down and starting to write the story. Well, I mean, I kind of I the book was I had a full draft by that point, so I I sort of knew, but I I realized if a, if. When I have such a small cast in this book, I, I feel like each character has to really matter um, and hold a purpose. Um, and so if someone's reading it and feeling that indifferent about one of my few characters, I needed to kind of circle back. 
Okay, you, you may have touched upon this. Um, it, Italy S asks, does the book have to do with your or someone's real life experience? Um, no, this is this will be this is just straight fiction. Okay. And then Donald M asks, what approach slash strategies do you use to conceptualize the plots in your books? How much is tied to current events? Are you already working on the next book? Which I think we, we talked about that last part. So, um, so what strategies do you use to conceptualize your plots of your books and how much is tied to current events? Yeah, um, I would say my, some of my work is tied to current events. And um, with my first novel, Fallen Mountains, um, you know, I had written that and I sort of pictured it in a place where um, the land was being overtaken by developers and housing developments were going up. Um, and in the middle of, of writing that book, I went, um, I spent some time up, my husband, who's a biologist, was studying the effects of fracking on um, ecosystems up um, in northern Pennsylvania. And when I went up there and saw how drastically the landscape was altered by these fracking operations, I knew that I needed to change the setting of that book. So, um, so, and that was, you know, a big current event when I was writing that book for, for us in Pennsylvania. Um, so it is, uh, to, it is uh, affected by current events. Um, I don't think these silent woods probably was, was affected a whole lot by um, current events. I think my next one has a little bit of it in there. Um, there was a second part of this question that I'm totally forgetting, I'm sorry. Um, the second part was, oh, what approach or strategies do you use to conceptualize the plots? So, uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I sometimes I when I first sit down to start, and I love that feeling of starting a book and not really knowing exactly where it might end up, um, and letting the characters sort of guide where things might go. Um, I love that feeling, and and it also also at the same time, eventually I have to come up with an outline. Eventually, so right now I have an outline. It's color coded um, so that I know what I need to be having in each chapter and I sort of have it color coded right now because it helps me think well like this chapter can be uh, blue as backstory so I can you know but I can't have every chapter be blue you know so, um, so then I'll aspire to have tension in certain chapters or a little bit of both in each chapter and so it's um, you know I, I, I do I think this is a good way for me to visualize the overall you know feel of the book the shape of the book. See, I absolutely hate that feeling of sitting down and not knowing <laughs> where the story is going to go. Yeah, it's so uh, funny I, because writers have different approaches yeah. to this. Yeah, I, I, I want to make my mistakes in my daydreaming process um, rather than sit there and stare at the computer and say, if I, if I go down this tangent for 10,000 words, is it going to play out or not? So. Um, yeah. I, I, I it's try probably more efficient. Your your path is <laughs> probably more efficient because um, with my first novel, I I realized that I had made a mistake and I cut forty thousand words and had to rebuild that. So it does. That's that's the cost of of you know floating around a bit. You cut forty thousand words. I did. Wow. Yes. And that's rewrote a... it. That was like half the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so what's the coolest thing, you know, secondary to being the Barnes and Noble pick of the month? Uh, what's the coolest thing that has happened to you as an author? Um, well, I think, you know, Alan, I just never want to take for granted the fact that people are buying my work and bringing it into their home and putting it on their nightstand and their coffee table and um, like throwing themselves into this make-believe world that I built and, um, and often sharing it with friends. It's just like such an incredible privilege to have, um, to have that opportunity where people do that for you and that, um, that they enjoy it. And so it's just, I don't know. I, I never want to take for granted that sense that, um, you know, people bring their work into their house and um, spend hours in it. You know, it's just really cool. 
I know that exactly. Um, I have a companion question, but I'm going to go back to someone who asked, what are the color-coded topics you use? Oh, <laughs> so I will say, just this full disclosure here, that this is a new approach for me that I'm doing on my new work in progress because I flounder a bit sometimes. So my color coded is, um, <laughs> so I have blue for backstory, red for tension, um, purple for sparks, meaning romantic sparks, and green for friendship. Because the book is also a little bit about the um, kind of complicated nature of women's friendships. So um, I'm sort of weaving in and hopefully, you know, I'm always hoping that I'm gonna be writing, you know, multifaceted fiction that where there's always I really like genre bending fiction too so that there's a, a number of things going on um so those are the color codes that I'm working on we'll see how this works out do you have a whiteboard or do you use like post-it notes I have or um, pens yeah colored pens yeah I don't I don't have the whiteboard do you I do yeah. I, I'm I'm all in on this outlining thing yeah uh, I start with a sketchbook and when my outline becomes too big for me to see on a, you know, double page of a sketchbook, I then take it to my whiteboard and I will do, I'll use color codes too. I'll use a green pen for this point of view or a blue uh -huh. pen for, you know, if I'm going back and forth in time, the blue will be this period of time and the red will be this period of time. Uh -huh. So I can see the story, but also, you know, visualize you know, the, the different aspects of it. So yeah, I, I, <laughs> I'm a big outliner. Yeah. So. Um, Alice Feeney, I remember her saying that she spends so much time outlining that by the time she sits down to actually start writing, it's like really quick. She can, she's really fast because she's already thought through every detail, every facet. Um, and so she's, she, it sounds like you guys have similar processes where it does. So my companion question to the earlier question was what is the most unusual unexpected or weird thing that has happened to you as an author? Um, you know, the, <laughs> there are always um, sometimes the live events, um, like pers in-person events. I always have a little bit of hesitation because you just never know what might happen at, at these things. And so, um, I, one time I did one and the person, it was supposed to be Q&A, and a person stood up and said, I would like to share a poem. And then recited a poem that they had written. And so that was unexpected. Um, like, I, you know, I just wasn't expecting that. And it was kind of um, like, uh, I, I'm drawing a blank on the word, but it had sort of a beat to it, you know, so. That was, that was unexpected. Um, I also did an event at a college once. Um, it was my alma mater. And so this person was like, I got a question. And he stood up and he said, why, when you mention our dining hall, why do you make it sound like the food's bad there? So, <laughs> um, you know, and meanwhile, I'm on stage and there are like a thousand people sitting there and I was, I wasn't prepared for that, but I think, you know, hopefully I was able to field the question, but I just feel like sometimes you just never know like what might happen at these things. So was the dining hall mentioned in a story or in a I presentation? Think, it's in, um, it's like one line, like one half of a sentence in um, my first book, Silver Like Dust. And I mentioned something about what they were serving at the dining hall that day. And, you know, obviously this person was reading closely so good for him but he did not <laughs> like that I said like was the chicken steak chicken fried steak chicken or steak we weren't sure something like that and um he was offended and he uh, but it that. wasn't you saying that it was the character so uh, no 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 it was a memoir so it was me saying oh it was that. you oh <laughs> that's why he was very upset about it yep well you, you have different tastes in food than he does that's right <laughs> Um, we're coming up to the end of our time. It's 2.55 right now. So if you have any final questions, uh, now is the time to ask. Uh, um, Kimmy, do you do you ever travel in terms of like going to BoucherCon or other conferences or do you just pretty much stay at home and write? Um, you know, I haven't. Uh, we, I have largely been home for the last two years, you know, 
I have not gone out much, but I would love to, to you know, start hitting with some of those events soon. I, I, I invite you to, to BoucherCon. It's a, it's always a fun time and a lot of interesting writers. I got to meet one of my heroes, Dennis Lehane, oh, um, wow. this past, uh, well, last month at BoucherCon. Um, on that note, who are your writing heroes? Um, that's a good question. Um, recently, I, I loved Where the Crawdads Sign. Um, I loved, uh, I feel like Hannah Tinty is a master of literary suspense and Peter Heller too. Um, yeah, and probably my ultimate, oh, I actually just read Michael Christie's Greenwood, which was phenomenal. I just am in such deep admiration of him um, and Anthony Doerr too. Okay, one last question from Bill. Um, for your background of character, how would you suggest to use it? For your background of a character, how would you suggest to use it? I wrote a story and I was told the background was too early. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Do you? Um, hmm. I wonder when, if when, it's I, a when you're creating a pacing when you're creating question. a when you're creating a background for a character, how do you De deploy the background how do you bring it into the story i think is what he's asking yeah yeah i i think um you know for what it's worth i've been told uh i have been told a similar thing it was it was on the story that eventually became the silent woods um where someone commented we felt like the backstory was more interesting than the, the real story and <laughs> so that's why they rejected it so i think it's always a matter of um, and yet, at the same time, you do read stories sometimes where, like, most of the story feels like backstory. But um, I, I think uh, figuring out a good pacing, I, I think generally it's good to maybe not start with a character's background, like maybe try to get the ball rolling with a plot and then weave some background in um, after you sort of get the reader kind of turning pages. I'm not sure if that answers the question or not, but... I, I think it does. And I, I found that I, I like to tell backstory in parables where um, I will I will tell a little excerpt of this person's life that gives the information that I want to to give as opposed to um, just laying out when I was young, I did this, I would actually tell a story about him doing that. Um, that just is my own preference, I think. But yeah. uh, we are coming to the end of our rainbow. Uh, Kimmy, it's been so wonderful um, talking to you. I want to remind everybody out there that if you haven't read this book, you should go out and get it. Uh, the Silent Woods is on sale at Barnes and Nobles everywhere. Um, they have their own little table. Uh, if you want to order it in the middle of the night, you can order it at, um, I don't know if it's bnn.com or barnesandnoble.com, but th their website um, and uh, read it and enjoy it. Uh, I want to thank everybody for for showing up today and listening to us. Uh, Kimmy, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I've, I've known of you and you know, read your stuff for years. As, this is the first time you and I have actually spoken in person. So it's been a great pleasure. Yes, I feel the same. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you, Barnes & Noble, for hosting us. And thank you, um, all your readers and participants, for your questions today. Thanks for hopping in. OK. And uh, I'm being told my internet is unstable. <laughs> so uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, I think that concludes it.